So these three chapters, 15, 16, and 17, covered the most um, esoteric part of the tatwas or the basic elements, the three gunas, sattva, rajasan, tamas. In chapter 15, it was more about a general understanding of the three gunas. Chapter 16 is more about the personal qualities related to individuals. And you will see that chapter 15, 17 of the Bhagavad Gita is more about the actions and how our actions may be rajasic, tamasic or sattvic in nature. So we continue from where we left off the last, last time and that was uh, chapter 16 verse 6. If you recall, this chapter is about the demonic and the divine qualities. And that is generally our nature. While none of us are completely divine, neither are we entirely demonic in nature. Demonic sounds very strange because it's not something we relate to in persons. We think of demons as something mythical, mythological, but people have demonic qualities. Instead of the word demonic, if we were to use the word evil, negative, then this is what we are talking about. The good qualities in a person and the evil qualities in the person. And generally, we have a bit of both. I have yet to meet somebody who is entirely evil and somebody who is entirely good. We have a little bit of each of these. A lot depends on the circumstances, the phases of our life, the situation, the surroundings, and many other different factors. So we go a little bit deeper, a little bit further into this. These two primarily evil or good qualities in us. So chapter 16 verse 6 says, There are two kinds of created beings in this world, the divine and the demonic. The divine has been explained in detail. Now hear about the demonic from me, O son of Pritha. Demonic people know neither right conduct nor prohibition. In them there is neither purity nor character nor truth. They say that the world is untrue, without foundation, and godless, that it is produced only through sexual union, and that it has no cause other than what comes from passion. Blocked by this vision, their true nature destroyed, those of little intelligence doing fearsome acts come into power as malefactors for the world. Resorting to passion and desire, which is difficult to fulfill. Possessed of hypocrisy, seeking honor and frenzy. They of impure observances operate, seizing upon false holdings out of delusion. They have recourse only to immeasurable worry that goes on until dissolution. They are certain that the enjoyment of passions is supreme. That is everything. Bound by a hundred snares of expectation, intent upon passion and anger, they undertake the gathering of wealth by injustice for the purpose of enjoying passions. This I have received today. This wish of mine I shall gain later. This I have, and this wealth shall be mine. That enemy I have killed. Others too I shall destroy. I am sovereign, I am enjoyer, I am accomplished, strong, happy. I am rich, I have influential relations. Who 
else is equal to me. I shall perform sacrifices. I shall enjoy. Thus deluded in delusion, confused by many divisions in their minds, covered by the net of delusion, stuck in the enjoyment of passions, they fall into the impure and lowly place. Holding high opinion of themselves, lacking humility, possessed of honour and frenzy, due to wealth, they sacrifice by sacrifices in name alone, in hypocrisy and without regard to correct injunctions. Resorting to ego, pride, power, passion and anger, full of malice, hating me in the body of others and in their own, these hateful, cruel, base humans in the world, the ugly ones, are ever thrown into demonic species alone. Fallen into demonic species, stupefied in life after life, without ever finding me, O son of Kunti, they then go to the lowest state. Those of us who would be really, really honest right now, if you are brutally honest to yourself, then I'm pretty sure you must have recognized some of these qualities in yourself. These qualities, some of them that have been narrated here in these verses, are in fact the very qualities that a modern materialistic way of life encourages even admires and aspires for. We all know people like this and we have some of these characteristic or tendencies ourselves. Isn't it true that our modern lifestyle encourages gathering of possessions, material goods. Do we not admire those who have large houses, big cars, lots of clothes, a house full of all sorts of beautiful objects, Do we not seek honor? Most of us want to be respected, admired, want to become famous. If not famous, at least well known. Is it not true that many of us have our minds preoccupied with sexual desires and thoughts? Are we not sworn, uh, swayed away by emotions like anger, greed? Our modern society is full of advertising which blasts us continuously with all sorts of, of objects that we should desire. And many of us get swayed away by this. And we also desire to look good, to be young, to have a lot of possessions. This is what we are continuously been subjected to by our surroundings. And if you are seen to be disinterested in these material objects, then people look at you as if you are a strange person. 
they think something is wrong with you. Most of us know people like this, those who are always counting their money, seeing what do they have, what can they have, you know, in the near future, how shall they get those, those desired objects. Are they not getting competitive? We know a lot of these people, maybe you yourself are one of them, who is in an environment where you are very competitive. You have to be, because if you don't push yourself through, you will not get the next raise, you will not get the next promotion, and you will not be able to get all those things that you want apart from honor and respect, some titles, to have also material wealth, which is maybe related to the respect and the titles and, uh, and these things. So there is an environment created of competition and survival of the fittest very rajasic kind of atmosphere. We go through these things and many of us are then very proud that we have money, we have some influential relatives and the ego develops. The ego becomes very powerful. You may even do good actions, like may do charitable actions, but all for the purpose of ego. So that you feel good, so that you feel uh, you compensate for maybe all the other things you know you have done that are not right, maybe thamasic, and you try to compensate for those actions. You try to buy yourself good merit. You do some sort of donations and charity in order to show off. These are tamasic, rajasic reasons. The desires are so many. The mind is so divided. Maybe there is a small part of the mind that really wants something genuine, something higher. But that is so completely overwhelmed by the mind that is seeking worldly objects, wants to have name, fame, all these other things where the passions of anger, sexual desires, greed, jealousy, all these become so strong. There's so much confusion, such a web of delusion that it's very difficult to come out. Yet, such a person deludes himself, fools himself, and creates a kind of a mask for the world around him. And you get yourself a nice title, you call yourself a doctor something, or a president or vice president or of a company, you give yourself some nice title, and you feel that you have, you're something special, you're better than the others. So you have a very high opinion of yourself completely lacking in any humility. And all the good actions they do is actually nothing but hypocrisy because they merely want to do it for show. So this is all about ahankara. This is all about emotions such as greed and pride and anger and even hatred. And why hatred? Because you don't hate actually others more than anything. You have developed a hatred for yourself because you know you're impure, you know you're divided. 
and you know that that little part in you which is genuine which is authentic which is seeking something higher has been completely pushed away in the background completely ignored and all these base qualities have been promoted encouraged and strengthened and so you see yourself as ugly you begin to hate yourself and this vicious cycle continues and you fall deeper and deeper into darkness of ignorance known as tamas so what is described as demonic qualities of an asura is not necessarily some sort of a mythological monster or or demon but in fact are those qualities within you within you yourself and you can see them in yourself you can see them in others around you as well but remember that on reading these and on contemplating we are very good at finding these qualities in others but a truly satvic person would look for these qualities in himself or herself a true seeker is not looking at the faults of others but looking at himself and seeing where he can work with himself so i'm sure that all of us have seen some of these qualities in ourselves and you may have condemned yourself for these you may have recognized this as i was reading and you may have told yourself oh you have also these demonic qualities but to condemn oneself is not very useful you see yourself you have these qualities and now we need to see how we can work on ourselves to transform ourselves and to come out of that vicious cycle and not to fall deeper into the darkness Is anybody got any thoughts about that If not I will continue This is the threefold gate of hell that destroys one's pa- self passion anger and greed therefore one should give up these three One freed from these three doors of darkness or son of kunti conducts himself towards benefaction for himself and thereby reaches the highest state in different scriptures it has been called differently here it is the, the gates to hell the three gates to hell in some places they are called the three knots in the tantric traditions for example and these are kama passion krodha anger and loba greed these three take us in a spiral of negativity into deeper and deeper darkness we need to overcome these three and how to do that people ask me repeatedly how do i come out of these and there are t- basically two ways of doing this the superior way is learning how to do vairagya learning to be non attached 
to be able to see and witness these in yourself, in your own character, in your own nature. This is the higher path. So this one must learn to master meditation, learn to master how to do these things, which is not very easy. But the other way is Thiyaga. Thiyaga means that you simply give it up. You use your willpower and you simply give it up. The positive about that is that that it's easier to do if you have willpower that you simply say, I will not do this. I will not go running after all these material objects. I'm not going to be greedy. I'm going to be satisfied with what I have. But the downside is that if the desire is there, deep inside you, it is suppressed. It is still there. It is not manifested externally, but it is there. But we need to start somewhere. For a lot of people who do not know how to practice Vairagya, one option is learning to experiment with Tiaga, seeing whether you can make certain sacrifices, see what you can give up. It's probably easier to start with the material objects to say, I will manage with less. I will not go and buy myself more clothes. I will not go and buy myself still another car. I'm happy in the small house that we have. I don't need to get myself a bigger place and fall into financial debt and, you know, all the other problems that come up when you end up in debt. So you learn to live a simpler life. We need to experiment with these. There is no hard and fast rule. If you are practicing meditation with a guide, then eventually you will sooner or later learn to do Vairagya. When you do Vairagya, then it doesn't matter whether you, what kind of objects these are and they're merely objects for you to enjoy and you don't get attached to them. But if you have not learned to do that, you can experiment with Tiaga. One needs to take care that when you do Tiaga, you do not end up in a situation where you suppress these desires. For example, when it comes to sexual passions, we need to understand how to live with these in a healthy manner. So, karma, krodha, lobha, these three, passion, anger, and greed, are the gateways to darkness, tamas. And we need to learn how to experiment with these and how to live with these in a healthy manner. And how shall we do that? As I said, one is, of course, experimenting. And verses 23 and 24 say, One who, abandoning the injunctions of the scriptures, conducts himself through actions based on desire, does not attain fulfillment or happiness or the highest state. Therefore, for you, the scripture is the authority in order to determine 
what ought to be done and what ought not to be done. Knowing the act is taught in the scriptural injunctions, you should perform your actions. Basically, follow the path of the sages. The sages have come before us, have already experimented with all these things, and they have left behind all the teachings, especially those through an unbroken lineage. And you can learn these with the help of a guide or teacher who can interpret these scriptures or these teachings for you. When we read these scriptures or these teachings on our own, through the filter of our own mind, we will read into it whatever we want. But with the right teacher or guide, we learn how to interpret these correctly. And when that happens, we understand what right action means, what we should do and what we shouldn't do. It may therefore be necessary in the earlier stages that you have a good teacher. Eventually, when you have reached a certain point in your development and your understanding through experience, that is no longer required. But that is why we need, we need a teacher to interpret the scriptures. And following the scriptures, we do not need to be lost in our experiments and, and making mistakes and suffering. Those who do not follow the scriptures end up with a great, great deal of suffering. They learn, so to say, the hard way. They do the experimentation, they suffer a great deal and they learn it the hard way. And that means a longer time and maybe many, many more lifetimes of suffering. So that was chapter 16. Any questions so far about this chapter? About the evil and the good qualities in us? About the path of the sages? Everybody seems to be quite content, in which case we move on to the penultimate chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. It's chapter 17. It's the second last chapter and very similar to the earlier two chapters, also about Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. But now it is more detailed and with respect to the practice itself. This chapter is called Shadra Traya Vibhag Yoga. Shadha is means actually faith, but it is meant in the sense of your conviction or your practice, how you, what you follow, your path. And there are three paths or three kinds of paths or Convictions. Arjuna asked, Those who sacrifice, endowed with faith, but abandoning scriptural injunctions, what is their status, O Krishna? Is it sattva or rajas or tamas? 
The blessed Lord said, The faith of the body bearers is of three kinds, born of their nature, which is sattvic, rajasic or tamasic. Do hear thereof. Everyone's faith develops according to his mind's sense. O descendant of Bharata. Thus, the person consists of faith, whatever one's faith that is indeed, that indeed is he. The sattvic ones sacrifice to deities, the rajasic ones to demigods and powerful semi-human beings like yakshas and rakshasas. Others, the tamasic ones, sacrifice to ghosts and to multitudes of other beings. Let us understand Arjuna's question clearly. He says those who practice, here the word sacrifice does not mean just rituals or ritual sacrifices, but sacrifice is used throughout the Bhagavad Gita also to mean all form of action which is selfless or in service of the divine. It is it could be genuine practice sadhana or it is in general actions. So Krishna is being asked by Arjuna what about those who practice some sort of sadhana or way of life but they are not following the scriptures. See, they are doing something, but it's not following the scriptures. They are doing their own thing. <laughs> it might sound familiar to you. These days, there are a lot of people doing their own thing. So you find everywhere they go, a lot of yoga schools and yoga teachers who are doing a mishmash of things. They have taken a little bit from books, a little bit from some teachers, a little bit of their own creativity, uh, a little bit of their business acumen, all put together, they have created their own practices. And they are not really following the scriptures or any kind of guidance coming from somebody who has some insight. They have created their own thing. Because that's what people do these days. So, what does one think of that? You can imagine from this question that this is not something just happening today, these days, in modern times. It has always been happening. It is human nature. Does Krishna think of these activities? Are they sattvic, are they rajasic, or are they tamasic? So the scriptures say, well, whatever practice you do, it is naturally going to depend on your personality and your mind. If you are tamasic in nature, your mind is tamasic, then you will only come up with tamasic ideas and you will be attracted to tamasic people and obviously your practice will also be tamasic. If you are a very rajasic person, rajasic means somebody who is very aggressive, very active, very dynamic, maybe a little bit egotistical, proud. What do you think such a person is going to end up doing? Obviously, such a person will be attracted to rajasic teachers, teachers who are also very aggressive, outward, you know, externally oriented. And what kind of practice will they do? They will also do practice that is rajasic, pr promoting the ego. That is what is going to happen. So this is natural that what we do depends basically on the nature of our mind.
So he goes on to explain. Shri Krishna says, Those people who undertake terrible ascetic practices, which are not enjoined by the scriptures, conjoined with hypocrisy and ego, possessed of the power of attachment, those unwise ones, weakening the group of elements in the body and also me who dwells within the body, know them to be of demonic determination. Today, our problem is that in modern society, everybody wants to be a teacher. Nobody wants to be a student. Nobody wants to spend time going deeper into the self, into the mind, studying, practicing, and maturing. They read a few books, attend a few courses, go to a few teachers, mix things, and they are suddenly teachers with a big brand name and a big business behind it. Well, this is the problem today. Earlier, the problem was of a different nature. That time, mostly, people were taking up very, very uh, torturous ascetic practices. It was known as tapasya, and such people were called tapasvis. And they did terrible torture, self-torture, fasting for incredibly long periods or taking up some vow like um, standing with one arm held up until the arm has completely atrophied, you know, and other such torturous, you know, some terrible things, can't even describe some of them. So that was the nature then of the ascetics who did such practices. And this is not mentioned in any scriptures. No scriptures are recommending such things. No scriptures saying, starve yourself to death, torture your body. And this was done primarily by those who were very, had very strong egos. They basically wanted to show what kind of tortures they can go through. There was a great deal of hypocrisy because there was a show over there of showing to the others what they can do. And perhaps some innocent people were impressed by this. And uh, that was the nature of the abuse of, of these practices in those days. These days, as I said, it is not so much about terrible ascetic practices, rather it is about ego in a different form. And the form it has taken these days is that everybody has become a teacher and everybody has made yoga and spirituality into a business. Either way, this is not recommended by the scriptures to weaken the body in this form. This kind of behavior is considered to be demonic or rajasic and tamasic, which is evil in nature. So forms of extreme renunciation, forms of extreme torture are not recommended by the scriptures. We come to verses 7 to 10. But before I continue, uh, any questions from anybody? Any thoughts? Any comments? Is everybody okay so far? Okay, in that case, we will continue. I mentioned at the beginning that 
this chapter is goes into further detail about the practice and and defines it in the terms of tamas raja sansatva and one of the most important things about practice is food these verses 7 to 10 talk about food and food is something that i think everybody can relate to the favorite food of everyone is also of three kinds so also sacrifice ascetic endeavor and charity listen to their distinctions those that increase life span mental essence strength health comfort and pleasantness that are flavorful unctuous stable and satisfying to the heart are the foods that are flavor favored by the satvik bitter sour salty excessively hot pungent dry burning are foods favored by the rajasik causing discomfort depression and illness not fully cooked flavorless smelly stale left over by others not fit as an offering is the food favored by the tamasik this chapter will now define in the same terms of rajas tamas and sattva the practices that we do how we do charity the food we eat all this in this manner sattvic people by nature naturally like food which is which would encourage promote health strength life span above all it makes you more conscious aware and alert mentally it does not disturb you mentally or your emotionally it is flavorful and satisfying sattvic foods have been described by me very often some of them are which say food which is freshly cooked which is light easy to digest a lot of fruit vegetables are all sattvic in nature these don't have very strong flavors it's mildly flavored and it is very light on the other hand food that is very strongly flavored which is very either very bitter very sour very salty very spicy all these very strong flavors are rajasic and rajasic people enjoy such food meats for example also come in this category these kind of foods cause discomfort which means they are very heavy you don't feel very alert after that it may they may even cause emotional imbalance mood swings and they cause illnesses satve uh, rajasik foods um, give you a lot of um, energy but it is excessive energy and because this energy cannot be utilized very well it causes emotional problems if you are by nature a very active person or you are in a profession where you are very active like if you are a sports person or you are in the you know the army or or you are a person who is doing hard physical hard labor then perhaps it's not so uh, harmful but otherwise it would be not very healthy for you what do tamasic people favor tamasic people by nature like food that's very heavy very oily deep fried the food 
actually doesn't have much flavor in it but it's it's almost is very often stale you know processed highly processed foods deep frozen foods a uh, f- lot of sugary foods these are all tamasic foods that are left over old food you know is also tamasic so these foods are uh, attractive attractive for those who have a tamasic nature a sattvic person would not like to eat such things but if you would eat such things this will affect your mind it will make you dull it will make you heavy it will make you disinterested in everything you you feel sleepy and drowsy so this is the nature of food taken in and so you can see that if you are working to purify your body and mind you would want to have sattvic food any questions about this food Uh, I didn't hear that last part. Which type of bread is what? Good. Good. Oh, good. Um, well, the thing with breads is that here in the West, most breads are made out of wheat, and they use yeast to raise the bread. And this kind of bread. Um, is not necessarily good at least not good to have on a regular basis one can always have these things once in a while uh in um asia in middle east is a old tradition of having breads that are flat breads flat breads they don't rise So if you are able to get flat bread that is definitely better than those breads that are uh you know risen uh, using using yeast. If you can bre- get breads or which are of different grains other than wheat not always wheat but get a variety of breads then that's definitely uh good to have a different variety. uh one can also make for example breads out of corn you know out of maize these uh, what in mexico is known as tortillas but but not of wheat tortillas but out of corn one can also make them at home then millet breads these are excellent these can also be made at home uh if you're looking for breads um in the market here in europe you also get rye breads or you can try uh, different grains but these days people eat so much wheat it's so much an excess that almost all other grains have been pushed out so one needs to get variety into the diet so that it doesn't the, the extreme wheat uh, it, it's wheat is very rajasic and so too much of wheat is not healthy it needs to be balanced with a variety of different grains of course you can also use uh, whole grains not always white bread white breads do not have much nutrition they are lighter to digest but they are pretty much empty calories there is not much nutrition value in these okay you can experiment uh, at home try to make a uh, millet uh, bread you can look at some recipes in the internet and uh, it's it's not so difficult to make or even these corn tortillas one can make them at home they're not so difficult they actually very fast as well so you can try them out 
Thank you very much. Okay. Anything else about food? Okay. In that case, we continue. Verses 11 to 13 are about the different kinds of practice that uh, we have. So, now that we've spoken about the food, what kind of food is healthy for practice, the actual practice itself is also discussed now. That sacrifice performed according to scriptural injunctions by those not desirous of the fruit, harmonizing the mind with the thought one must sacrifice, that is sattvic. With the intention of fruit, or even of hypocritical purpose, the sacrifice that is performed thus, know it to be rajasic, O best of Bharata. Against scriptural injunction, without distributing food, without mantras, without priestly gifts, devoid of faith, such a sacrifice is tamasic. Now, whatever you may call sacrifice, as I mentioned that sacrifice does not only mean rituals. Sacrifice also means your daily actions, how you perform your daily actions, with what spirit, with what bhava you're performing. Are you performing everything because you want something? So if you are taking care of your family, is it with the intention that your family should also do something for you? If you are a teacher, are you teaching with the intention that your students will give you something? Money, gifts, or whatever. If you are working in the office, of course you are working for money. But do you also have the, the spirit of wanting to do something, change something, make a difference? So, the bhava is very important in your actions. What about your own practice, your sadhana, when you perform? Are you performing with the intention of, oh, I want to do sadhana so that all my desires are fulfilled? So a practice or sadhana that is done simply because there is a deep longing to just be or there is a longing to just know oneself and not for a certain purpose or goal. That is a sattvic practice. When you reach that point in your sadhana where you just love to just be on your seat and just do your practice and gives you so much joy without any reason, that is the most sattvic sadhana. If you do the sadhana for a reason, such as just to show others well, what a sincere person you are. This is absolutely hypocritical. This is rajasic. Or because you want something. A lot of people come and tell me, you know, uh, I'm doing this practice to help somebody. I'm doing this practice for this reason or that reason. When you have such reasons, you know, then what happens is uh, these are called rajasic, this kind of practice. And when you do something which is totally against the scriptures, one of the things which was mentioned earlier here was doing um, sort of a self-torture through extreme ascetic practices. If you do such things which are against the scriptures and you call that your sadhana, you do not distribute food means donation. You know, there's a tradition uh, in India and in many parts of the world to feed the poor, to feed animals, to feed the poor. And so if you do not feed others, if you don't show hospitality and if you do not feed the poor, do not help the poor, if you do not use the mantras in the proper way, if you do not give gifts, Priestly gifts, of course, those days was referring to the fact that when you performed rituals, you gave the 
priests some gifts. But if you do not show that generosity, if you become a miser, then it's also considered to be tamasic. Remember that the word miser and misery are related to each other. Those who are miserly will become miserable. So learn to be generous. And it doesn't mean generous just about gifts or some material things. But be generous in all the things in your life. Be an open, sharing person. That is a generous person. So these are tamasic practices or tamasic sadhana. So I mentioned to you that one of the modern day tamasic activities in this area is uh, those who are, uh, you know, teaching all mixed practices from different places. Similarly, there are students who also do this. They take a little bit from one teacher, take another from another tradition, take something out of a book and then they make their own practice. I have heard this so often and I have had people coming to me and explaining what their practice is and sometimes it is shocking how they have created practices from different places, different traditions and some of them just inventing their own things, you know. And this is the best, it's a waste of time. And in the worst case, it can even be harmful at a pranic level. So we have now learned to distinguish between the kinds of practice. This goes into further detail now here. The, the different kinds of practice but the hour is up and so I think this might be a good place to stop we can continue next time and next time we will also probably start with the very last chapter any questions so far related to to whatever we have done so far the three kinds of practice, the three kinds of food, the nature of the mind, also of three, threefold. Remember that these three chapters, chapter 15, 16 and 17, elaborate on the gunas, rajas, tamas and sattva. There is, it's very elaborate. And the very last chapter, which we will start also next time, is in a grand overview, the grand finale of the Bhagavad Gita. A beautiful chapter because it actually just summarizes everything. It's, a, it's a perfect for, you know, seeing the whole thing, then uh, the big picture. After having gone into great detail with the Gunas. So there seem to be no further questions. In that case, we can stop here. I wish everybody a, a nice weekend, everyone. And we will meet next time, same time, to start the very last chapter. Okay, bye everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye yeah. Bye Subi. Bye. Bye Carlos.